Good morning. Scarlett and the, I think it's the Evangelism and Mission uh, Committee is having a retreat at Lake Junaluska, and so you get me. <laughs> so <laughs> whatever that means. Uh, but we do uh, wish them uh, good travel, uh, good time together, good time to fellowship. Let us pray. Gracious Father, on this chilly, cloudy day, we have come, we have come, some of us with heavy hearts, we have come thirsty for what you have to offer. Let your word seep through light, light our path, be with us in this hour, open our minds, open our hearts, that you would have us know all that you are. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you please stand for our call to worship, 176, followed by our hymn of praise, 694.
And now, if you would turn to 881 and join me with the historic Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. May be seated and I invite the children to come forward with Miss Brooks and if you would pick up any uh, prayer requests. One announcement that wasn't given and I don't know whether it was purposeful or not. Timmy, are we decorating for um, Advent next Saturday? Okay, November 28th. You anybody have a time? Nine o'clock next Saturday, if you can come and help decorate for the church, that would be, for Advent, that would be wonderful. Thank you. Do you need help, Susan? Thank you. 
Thank you. 
please. If you have permission, you may go to Children's Church. And while the children are leaving, if you would turn to 2215 in the Faith We Sing book as we prepare for prayer. Thank you, Miss Susan. As I read these prayer requests, I hope you will hold them in your heart and, and respond as the Lord calls you to do so. Dot Pace, Hannah Warren and family, the Petite family, Buddy and Dolores and family, the James family, Susie and Mark and family, the Gooch family, co-workers, those struggling with addictions, Pat Branion, Robin Hardy, the Claiborne Williams Burke families, loved ones, Marie Williams, Kendall Burke, Martin Sims, Kristen Claiborne, marriage relationships, retirement decisions, office matters, pregnancies, newborns, the Blythewood High School Choir, the Adlett family in the death of their father and grandfather, Rachel Mallard, David Hatcher Jr., Casey Hatcher, Robert Hatcher, Buddy Ellis, Elsie Jr., Mike Hillary, Rex and Pat Connor, David Hatcher, our youth, our church, and our country. Amber, safe travel for Thursday. Marsha Browder, Frank and Sherry Brown, Jimmy Owen, Fred Gross, Dot Pace, Steve Duncan, Stacy and Elaine Power, Katie and Chrissy Cooter, Pat and Joe Spell, Ricky Linker, Cynthia and the women's group on their travel today, safe travel for Scarlett and the ladies from the retreat, Dean James and his caregivers, Daniel Johnson, Patricia Smith, Beth Locklear, George, Melody, Samantha, Zachary, Megan, Cody, Amanda, and Buddy and Dolores. Let us pray. Gracious and almighty God, omniscient and all-powerful, we bow before you, humble and needy of the life-giving water only you can give. We're living in troubling times, Lord, and our hearts are troubled. Even though we know you are in control, we also admit to being nervous, even frightened at times. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We ask that you nourish us with an ever-growing and a maturing faith, a faith that shows love for all people. And Father, we ask you to be with the leaders of this nation and the nations around the world. We ask you to be with all those whose names and situations we read aloud, as well as those whose names we speak only with our hearts. Father, reveal to us yourself and to those who would threaten the Christian world, those we call our enemies for they do so need to know you. Wrap your arms around them 
and around us. Give us strength to be your light and your voice in this world. We ask in the name of your blessed Son who taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I ask that the ushers come forward so that we might have the privilege and the honor of giving to God his tithes and our offerings. Instead of the song that is listed, we are going to sing number 157 in the regular hymnal. See, this is thanks the Sunday before Thanksgiving, but it's also called Christ the King Sunday. So we're kind of going back and forth from Thanksgiving to Christ the King. So 157, please. <laughs>
please be seated and Ms. Renee will read our scripture. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, please join me in your bulletin for the prayer of illumination. Lord, open our minds by the power of your Holy Spirit that as the scriptures are read and your word proclaimed, we may hear with transforming joy what you say to us today. Amen. Uh, this morning I'm going to be reading out of the Good News Translation, it's, uh, Ephesians, the first chapter, verses 15 through 23. <clears throat> for this reason, ever since I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all of God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks to God for you. I remember you in my prayers and ask that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, to give you the Spirit who will make you wise and reveal God to you so that you will know him. I ask that your minds may be open to see his light so that you will know what is the hope to which he has called you, how rich are the wonderful blessings he promises his people, and how very great is his power at work in us who believe. This power working in us is the same as the mighty strength which he used when he raised Christ from death and seated him at his right side in the heavenly world. <clears throat> Excuse me. Christ rules there above all heavenly rulers, authorities, powers, and lords. He has a title superior to all titles of authority in this world and in the next. God put all things under Christ's feet and gave him to the church as supreme Lord over all things. The church is Christ's body, the completion of him who himself completes all things everywhere. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Renee. And, and I appreciate you reading it in the, good, in the good news or the message. The good news. Um, Scarlett asked me to preach a, a good while back, and she said, you can preach on Thanksgiving or you can preach on Christ the King Sunday, which is the last Sunday before Advent begins. And, you know, a number of years ago I preached on Thanksgiving, so I thought I should try and challenge myself and do Christ the King. And, and so a number of weeks I read the scripture and, and I thought and I thought and I thought and I read the scripture again and I thought and I thought and I thought. But, um, you know, finally this week uh, the Lord said, you know, Jack, you've been thinking lots, but you haven't been listening much. <laughs> and so when I read, read it out of the, the good news or the message or whatever one it was, um, uh, then I was able to think a little clearer and listen a little more and, and I give God the glory for that. Let us pray. Merciful God, let the words of my mouth be your words and may the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you and incline us to strive to live our lives dedicated to bringing disciples to you that all the world may be redeemed and live in harmony one with another. Amen. This letter to the Ephesians was written while Paul was in prison in Rome. He'd been to Ephesus a couple of times before. They were a strong church. They were a faithful church. There were no particular issues or concerns that Paul had. So it was really a, a letter to encourage them to keep on keeping on. And after Paul had praised their dedication to the Lord and he had praised their faithfulness and their love for others, then he offered them words of encouragement. And that's kind of like what a, a teacher does, or that's how I was trained anyway, was when you give a conference to someone, you always tell them what they're doing great. You're doing this great, you're doing that great, you're doing this great. Let's see if we can work a little bit more and improve just a little bit in this next particular area. And that's, and that's what Paul was doing. 
He prayed for them to seek wisdom, to know Christ better, and to have a heart to love his people. You see, he wanted them to be a thinking church, not just a church that would do kind of by rote. He wanted them to think about and have a deeper knowledge of God. And in, in acquiring that deeper knowledge, then they would begin to see the power of God. And they would begin to see that that power of God is stronger than anything. It's stronger than anyone. God's purpose cannot be stopped by the action of anyone or anything. God will reign supreme. God's going to win. And that's important for me. And I think it's important for us to remember as we see the events around the world unfolding as they have been the last few weeks. God will win. The faith community was so important to Paul, and he praises the church for their loyalty to Christ and their love of their fellow human beings. And if you think about it historically, the two, love of God and love of, of our fellow man, don't always go together. If you think of the monks who live a solitary life of silence and prayer, they know God. They spend a lot of time listening for the Lord and praying. And as honorable as that is, they don't necessarily have a relationship with God's people. And, and if you think about the Spanish Inquisition, those who killed in the name of God, if you weren't doing what you were supposed to do by the church's standards, you met up with a lot of trouble. They killed in God's name. They loved the Lord. But did they carry Christ's message of love to all the people? Is that really what God wanted? And even the Pharisees during the time of Jesus, they had a love and a loyalty to God. No one doubts that. But they showed contempt for those whom they considered lesser than themselves. Paul points out that Jesus showed us a very different path. Doesn't the true Christian love God and also his fellow man? Matthew 27, 37 to 39. Does anyone know what that says? But you know it. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and, and your neighbor as yourself. I heard a message on the radio not so long ago, and that said that Christians need to be very sure, very, very sure, that they carry the word of God in one hand and the love of God in the other hand. Sometimes we're better at doing that than other times, I think. But how do we get to that point where we, where we really can truly love those who hate us? How do we truly and honestly pray for those who are trying to tear apart the very fiber of Christianity. I'm saddened when I see hateful messages on social media from Christians that condemn those who believe differently than we do. How are we to become a loving and forgiving people of God? That's what he wants us to do, but it's tough. In Max Lucado's book, Just Like Jesus, he makes this supposition. God loves you just the way you are, but he refuses to leave you that way. He wants you to be just like Jesus. That's a really tall order, but let's just go with it for a bit. 
We love our children no matter what. But when they do something they shouldn't do, we try our best to correct them. God wants to do the same thing with us. Like our children, we don't necessarily enjoy the cleansing. And like our children, we can choose not to listen or obey. But if we take what he has to offer, each time we will become more like him. Our hearts seem so far from his, don't they? At least mine does. He's pure, we're greedy, he's peaceful, we are hassled, he is purposeful, and oh my gosh, I am distracted. How can we ever hope to have a heart like his? But you know what we do? We already have a heart like his. If we have given our lives to Jesus, and, and I know most of us around here have, and, and if we haven't, I encourage you to do so. But if we have given our lives to Jesus, Jesus has given himself to us. So if we have the love of Jesus, if the light of Jesus is all around us, why do we still stumble around in the dark so much? The story goes of, of a woman around the turn of the last century when they were just getting electricity, and she was very wealthy, but she was also very frugal. So when electricity came to her area, the, her neighbors were very surprised when she said, yeah, I want to get connected. So she, she, like all of the neighbors, got got electricity, but then several weeks later, the uh, meter reader noticed that there wasn't very much power being used, and, and so she, she, he knocked on the door and he said, is something wrong with your electricity? Is, is, are, are you not having success with it? And she says, oh yeah, I use it every evening. When the sun sets, I turn my lights on so that I can light my candles, and then I turn the lights off, and I'm just fine. You know what, she was tapped into the power, but she didn't use it. It's kind of the same thing with us. We've been baptized, confirmed, our souls are saved, but our hearts are unchanged. We're connected, but we aren't plugged in. Plugged into that wonderful power of the Lord. Oh, we may occasionally flip the switch and, and, and plug in, but most of the time we settle for the shadows. What would happen if we truly lived in the light of the Lord? We sing, we sing, oh, create in me a clean heart, oh God, or, or maybe mold me, make me like the divine. I was going to be, it was going to be real funny if Michelle had picked one of those songs. Um, but, but when we sing those songs, do we really mean it? We mean it when we're standing here and singing them and their wonderful melodies go through our, our minds. And, and even after church, we, I, I especially sing that mold me, make me like the divine. But I don't know, do we really mean it? What if? For 24 hours, Jesus lived your life with his heart. His priorities govern your actions. His passion drives your decisions. His love directs your behavior. Would people notice a change? I don't know, Jim. Would they notice a change in me? Jim used to say, before we got married or anything, he, he used to say, you know, you wear that robe on Sunday morning and then you go home and you're not the same person. <laughs> but if Jesus, if Jesus lived your life, would people notice a change? Would they perhaps see more joy, more optimism, 
How about those difficult people that you work with or, or live with? Would they receive more mercy? Do you think you'd sleep better? How about everyday life, the traffic jams, the long lines, the stubborn children? Would your life be any different? Think about it for a moment. And Lucado says, adjust the lens of your imagination until you have a clear picture of Jesus leading your life. Frame that image and snap the shutter. What you see is what God wants. Paul also prays that the Spirit would give the people of Ephesus more wisdom. God wants the same intimate relationship with him that he had with Jesus. Jesus knew the scriptures. He spent time studying the word, and he spent time with God in prayer. How many times in the Bible do you do you read, Jesus went alone to pray. He went to the lakeside to pray. He went to the mountain to pray. He went off by himself so he could pray. Spending time with God gives us the same opportunity to know him and to hear and to feel his love. I know I'm great at, at those serendipitous spur of the moment prayers but I'm not so good at taking myself away from the crowds in the quietness of the morning or the stillness of the evening and spending time with God, not talking, listening. How very soothing and uplifting those moments are when we can take the time to just breathe in the breath of God. Close your eyes and, and feel his power as he embraces and takes your worries from you. God is as near to you as the vine is to the branch, as the shepherd is to his sheep, but he can only be as near as you allow him to be. Being near to God allows us to see him more clearly. What does it mean to really see Jesus? The shepherds of long ago can tell you they weren't content to see and hear the angels proclaiming the good news they went to the manger. They needed to be near the Savior. The Magi weren't content to see a star, and they traveled miles and miles and miles to get a glimpse of the Savior, to bring him gifts, and to be near the Savior. John and Andrew were followers of John the Baptist, and they weren't content just hearing John talk about the Son of Man to come. They wanted to, they wanted to be near to Jesus. They wanted to know him. They wanted to study and follow in his steps. They wanted to hang out with Jesus. And Matthew, the tax collector, and Zacchaeus, and Mary, and Martha, and the leper, and so many more. Yes, they wanted to see him, but seeing him was never enough. They wanted to follow him and they wanted to be in his presence. How about us? Do we spend time in the presence of the Lord? Paul had praised the church in Ephesus for their effort in living a life of faithfulness to God and compassion to the world around them, but he didn't want them to stay there. He wanted them to plug into the power of God by growing in the wisdom of God and the love and the power of the God who has called them to live differently in the world around them. 
We need to live, to live differently than the world around us. To live a life worthy of the Savior, Jesus Christ. Paul wanted his people to be just like Jesus. And in the last two verses, Paul puts, puts forth that image that's so familiar to us. Jesus is the head of the church, and the church is the body of Christ. The bishop, the DS, the minister is not the head of the church. Jesus Christ is the head. And who is the church? Who is the body of Christ? Notice I didn't say, notice that pronoun. I didn't say what is the church. I didn't say where is the church. I said who is the church. Again, it's not the bishop. It's not the DS. It's not the minister. It's us. <clears throat> Casting Crowns has a great song called If We Are the Body. Does anybody know that song? Can you sing it? I tell you what, I thought of this song yesterday, so I couldn't exactly call Michelle and say, Michelle, would you do this for the choir? And, and I talked to, to Madison and Emily today and, and pulled it up, and, and we played it a little bit over the, over the intercom, but it came out kind of scratchy. And I can't sing, so you certainly don't want me to sing it. But, that's OK. Jim would say amen, too, but he knows where I live. I know where he lives. But anyway, the words of the Casting Crown song says, if we are the church, why aren't his arms reaching? Why aren't his hands healing? Why aren't his words teaching? And if we are the body, why aren't his feet going? Why is his love not showing them there is a way? And I can see some of you text there, putting it into your phone. It's a great song. It, it's, it's an inspirational song. Listen to it. Now, now we are at St. Mark. We're doing that. And as individuals, we're doing that some. But as I've said a couple of times today, God loves us just the way we are, but he refuses to leave us that way. He wants all of us. Pure and simple. He wants the good parts of us, and he wants the bad parts of us. Because God can wash us and make us clean. He can make us new. So then the rubber hits the road now. It's almost time to go to lunch. Are we content just hearing about him once a week for an hour or so or a couple of times a month here in church. What would it be like if we submitted our every thought to the authority of Jesus Christ? What would it be like if we committed time to be in his presence, not just pouring out our thoughts to him, but listening? What would it be like if we truly, if we all truly had a heart for Jesus? Would we think of ourselves a little less and others a little more maybe? Would we pray more for our enemies and those who think differently than we do? Would our actions and our words and our, face, our postings on Facebook change if we had more of a heart for Jesus. And I wonder if we would really feel more in control of our lives if we gave up that control to Jesus. And if we did all those things, could we dare to believe that our world could be different? Is it possible that Christian love could overcome the evil that seems to pervade our world today? Christ is the head, but we are the body. Could it be that God is waiting for us to be the hands and the feet and the heart and the words 
of Jesus. Until we do so, that power, that tremendous power of our Lord, might not reach its realization quite so soon. What would the world be like if we all had a heart brimming over with the love and the compassion of all God's people, just like Jesus, plugged into his awesome power? Oh, that we might see that day. A young child was talking to his dad and trying to figure out what it meant to have Jesus living in his heart. And he said, Daddy, Jesus lives in my heart, doesn't he? Yes, son, he does. And he lives in your heart too, doesn't he? Yeah, and mommy's heart and little sister's heart. And he went around and around talking. To, Is he in everybody's heart? And, and, and then he said, well, gosh, Daddy, Jesus must be really big. And Daddy said, yeah, yes, son, he is. And then the little boy thought for a minute, and he said, well, I guess. I guess he's, if he's living in all our hearts, he must be sticking out all over the place. Oh, that we might see Jesus sticking out all over the place. God loves us just the way we are. But he refuses to leave us that way. He wants us to be just like Jesus. And we can begin today or not. The choice is ours. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our closing hymn is in the green worship and sing worship and song book number 3040. Would you please stand? Mm -hmm. 